I'm absolutely thrilled to be here with you. Uh, despite my enthusiasm and that I do lots of public speaking, I feel just a tad nervous. Um, I have the utmost respect for Johnny Misley, who invited me to present. And so, um, one, I think he's a great leader, and two, I think he's an absolute gem of a person, and so I just don't want to let him down. I don't want to let you down. So, a few butterflies. Uh, I laughed when I read the promo material for me. It said that I'm going to uh, teach insights. So, I'm giving you my disclaimer now. I do not promise to uh, teach insights, impart wisdom, or leave you with any gems. Uh, what I do promise you is that I will tell you stories. My stories, but stories. And uh, I'll hope that some part of those stories resonates with you. So let me give you some context. I um, graduated from business school and started consulting. And it makes me laugh, 22, 23 year old consulting. What did I know? Really nothing. Uh, in any case, I started my career there, eventually made my way to a CEO of a publicly traded US telecom business. Truly, if I told you my whole career story, you'd know I was woefully underqualified for every job I've ever had. Uh, in any case, uh, when I got th to this telecom business, it was a mess. The guys before me had just bought four companies out of bankruptcy and there were skeletons falling out of every closet. And eventually, eventually, arm in arm with my team, we turned it around and I was very fortunate to be able to retire. So uh, from the time we sold the business and then after a year of retirement, I decided that I wanted to go change the world. And uh, I do have an MBA, but I went and have also a Master of Social Work. And I did my Master of Social Work because I wanted to go change the world. And so since uh, retirement, I've been in the not-for-profit world to go change the world. And um, it's, uh, you know, think about changing the world in the not-for-profit world. It's possible. And so my two jobs, as Ben just said, CEO of Participation, and uh, I'll tell you some of the stats physical inactivity stats, some of the obesity stats. And if you know those stats, participation has the potential to go change the world. And from there, then I moved to CEO of Tennis Canada. And if you think about the power of sport, uh, Tennis Canada has the power to change the world. And Tennis Canada, basically, its uh, business model is three pillars. So the first is participation, more rackets, more hands, more often. The second pillar of Tennis Canada is our major tournament, so Rogers Cup, Coop Rogers. And um, it generates a lot of revenue in sponsorship and ticket sales from those two uh, tournaments. And that's directly applied into the third pillar, which is our tennis development system. And in a nutshell, our tennis development system is working with local coaches at the local level, finding, developing talent, taking those great talent and put them into our regional training centers. The best of the best go to our national training center in Montreal. And then we work with our athletes on the professional level on the global stage. So, Participation, Tennis Canada, felt like I could go change the world. And so today, at least for the next 30, 40 minutes, what I'd love to do is tell you the six things that I learned, uh, or at least were reinforced again for me from my experiences at Participation and Tennis Canada. And as I share each of those learnings with you, I'll just tell you stories that led me to that learning. And uh, lots of the time I learned the hard way, and hopefully I will share that in the most candid way possible so you'll actually agree a lot of those lessons were learned the hard way. First lesson, together in sport, we can go change a kid's life. The first example I'll give you is just from my own life. So um, on the outside, I was told I'm the luckiest girl in the world. And on the inside, we had a really, really chaotic family life. So lots of alcoholism, lots of suicide attempts. And I tell you, honestly, I think I'm here today because of the role sport played in my life. And whether that was actually being physically active, the kids that were on my teams, the coaches, honestly and truthfully, coaches, refs, umps, we have the power to change a kid's life. And granted, I still have tons of dysfunctions. I'm anal, I'm a perfectionist, I'm hard on myself, 30 years of therapy, but I'm still here. And I really and truly do think that was because of sport. And the second ex um, example I'll give you is just these stats, as I promised, from participation. So 60% of our kids today in Canada do not meet the physical activity guidelines. And that is one hour of physical activity a day, 60%. Uh, more than half our kids are on recreational screens for more than two hours a day, unbelievably sedentary. Obesity rates continue to rise. 
Uh, we know that physical activity can reduce stress, reduce anxiety, reduce depressive symptoms. We know it can help brain function and help kids learn. And we know that um, it can actually help kids have self-confidence, self-esteem. So if you think about that in this room, if we could go and reverse those trends, that's change the world kind of stuff. And together we actually can go change kids' lives. The second lesson is um, sometimes we just need to be on the same team and not competing. So sounds kind of antithetical given that we're in sport and it's all about competition and winning. Uh, but sometimes we just need to be on the same team. And so my experience at Participation and Tennis Canada is that there's just never enough money. And so lots of physical activity organizations, lots of sport organizations are competing against one another for money. It is truly my belief, and again, I'm going to use the, the term, if we were arm in arm, what power we would have. So if sport organizations would get together and go build a pool of more money, we would have more money to deploy across the sector. And so participation, our job was really and truly to weave the physical activity and sports sector together. That was how we saw it. Um, after my seven years there, we were teeny tiny. We only had 15 employees. So some of you I know have sport clubs that have many more employees than that. Participation's tiny, tiny. And what we would do was we'd create a property, go find private sector dollars to support that property, and then we would project manage the delivery of that property. Participation did not deliver any properties or any projects. In fact, what we did would we would get organizations at the local grassroots level to deliver those properties. And the two examples I'll give you, one is we had a partnership with Coca-Cola. I have to tell you, I was in the news every day for a while that participation would partner with an evil organization like Coca-Cola. But if you think about the stats I told you before about physical inactivity levels, the most vulnerable population are teenagers. And so at participation, we wanted to go and target teenagers. How do we get teens more physically active? And I'm old, participation was an old brand, and we didn't know how to be cool enough to appeal to teenagers. So we thought about what private sector organization is cool, knows that audience, and can help us reach teens. And it was Coca-Cola. And so we did a 10-year, $10, $10 million deal with Coca-Cola. And in addition to that $10 million, they brought research and marketing and promo and a whole lot of other assets to the table. And over 10 years, we were able to work with 5,000 community organizations, and maybe some of your organizations were some of them, where we took uh, our Teen Challenge property and deployed it out at the grassroots level. So 5,000 organizations worked with us over those 10 years, and 500,000 teens got more physically active. There are lots of stats behind it, but a very, very successful property. And the second example I'll give you is we worked with RBC to create Sports Day in Canada. And I was speaking with Bjorn uh, earlier, and he was involved in Sports Day in Canada, so probably some of you were as well. And um, over the five years, what we did was we created Sports Day in Canada, and then really what it was was sport events at the local grassroots level being delivered by people like you. And so over those five years, we worked with 10,000 organizations at the grassroots level getting Sports Day in Canada live. And we ignited 5 million Canadians in that property. So again, let's uh, see if we can be on the same team, work together. And then Tennis Canada, I'll share two examples of this. One was um, in professional tennis, um, there is always a competition and a fight between the players and the tournaments. And um, players want more prize money, tournaments want to pay less prize money, and they're always at loggerheads. And so I was the only woman uh, in the Masters 1000 tournaments group. And so I just said, well, why wouldn't we just get together with the Players Council and have a bit of a conversation to say that we're actually on the same team. What we're trying to do is build and grow tennis. And they said, well, we don't do that. I said, well, all right, I'm gonna do it. So I worked with the CEO of the ATP. We hosted a dinner party in Miami. There were about 30 of us, the members of the Players Council, members of the um, Masters 1000 tournaments. And I had place, mats, uh, place settings so that people weren't able to sit with their pals. And for the first time in history, players sat with tournament owners and directors to have a conversation to understand we're just people and we're actually on the same page. And the last example I'm gonna give you about same page is um, as it relates to the Tennis Canada strategic planning process. So when I arrived, the Provincial Tennis Associations hated Tennis Canada. 
They thought that we were in an ivory tower, that we provided zero value, and that we were just wasting money, basically. And so um, in our strategic planning process, it is my belief that you have a smarter strategy if you involve your most important stakeholders. So we involved, yes, our employees, and yes, our board, but we also invited the Provincial Tennis Association to be part of our strategic planning process. And um, it was the first time ever that all of them were together with Tennis Canada talking about where is Tennis Canada going, where is tennis going, and how do we make sure that we're going there together. And then we had subsequent meetings, we met quarterly to talk about, all right, now how do we deploy this, how do we implement this, what's the performance agreement or commitments from Tennis Canada that they need to deliver, and what do the provincial tennis associations need to deliver. And together we held one another accountable to deliver on those, those um, objectives and goals. And we were actually moving in the same direction. Trust me, they were noisy meetings, and um, the CEO of the largest uh, PTA, I can remember, honestly, I, I was, I've never been yelled at as much as when I was at Tennis Canada. He was in my office or sitting at my table, and he's like leaning across, pointing in my face, yelling at me for something. I, d I don't remember what. But I heard through the grapevine a couple of months ago that he was in a meeting with Tennis Canada, and I'm no longer there. I haven't been there for three years. He said, I wish we had Kelly Mermet's back. She listened, and even though she was a pain in the back, she at least listened, and then she did what she said she would do. And I was like, oh, my God, if I could only... Tell Jim that I knew he said that about me. Uh, anyways, we are on the same team moving in the same direction. And the last thing I'll say though about this strategic planning process is um, one of my board members, uh, I think he was a fan of mine when they hired me, but he slowly was no longer a fan of mine because he had been the strategic guru uh, behind Tennis Canada's strategy. And so he told the CEO what the strategy was, the CEO told PTAs, employees, board, here's the strategy. It's not my belief. I believe you involve stakeholders. I believe you end up with a smarter strategy. I believe you have commitment to implement. And so I didn't ask him to be the strategic guru for Tennis Canada. And um, I can tell you now, he made my life so difficult. So every single board meeting, he was just brutal to me. He would tell me to be quiet. I'm the CEO of the organization. And I would leave, and I'm tough as nails, but I would be in the cab going home crying. And my husband was like, why are you staying there? I said, because it's not right. We're going to make sure that we do this right. Um, and in the end, at this guy's last dinner, board dinner, so I'm there with my board that I report to and three or four of my employees. And he made a speech about me saying I was the least competent CEO he'd ever worked with in his 30-year career. Anyways, good riddance. And um, <laughs> he's not there any longer. And we did do it together. And I feel like we made great progress not competing, but collaborating. My third, there is no substitute for human, authentic relationships. That is not a lesson I learned, but it was certainly reinforced at Participation and, and Tennis Canada. So I have a whole bunch of examples. At Participation, um, the CEO of Coca-Cola, uh, with whom I did the Teen Challenge uh, deal, he was so passionate about Team Challenge. And I, as you can see, I was so passionate about Team Challenge. We were working from our heart and soul. And what did Coca-Cola need out of the deal? What did participation need out of the deal? We worked together that we became very good friends. And um, he, he's my age. He was my age. And when he passed away from cancer, his family asked me to give the eulogy. I've never been more honored. So authentic human relationships. At Tennis Canada, uh, well, actually, it started at Participation. I did a deal with the president of CBC Sports, and Johnny probably knows Scott Moore. He's an absolute character, real character. Anyways, I convinced him at CBC Sports to do this deal with RBC and us and do Sports Day in Canada. And uh, then he moved from CBC Sports to Rogers Sports and Rogers Cup. Happens to be sponsored by Rogers, and he was the president of Rogers Sport. And when we were renegotiating our deal with Rogers for the Rogers Cup, I met with Scott and I said, so now we're negotiating again, this time a little bit bigger, now it's for Rogers Cup. And he said, I can never say no to you. I said, perfect, because the deal is this. He said, are you crazy? I said, listen, the dollars have increased so much because of the equity built into tennis in Canada right now. We've got stars like coming through and tennis is hot and the media rights are gonna be worth a lot. In the end, I talked him into this crazy deal, and um, he recommended it to Guy Lawrence, who was the CEO of Rogers at the time, and Guy and I did a handshake deal on this really absurd uh, set of um, terms, 
And I think it was the biggest deal in, uh, at least as an NSO uh, history. So very proud of that, but authentic human relationships. Uh, at Tennis Canada, uh, we also were hated by uh, coaches, so private coaches, because private coaches believed that they were investing in the talent at the local level. They were giving blood, sweat, and tears, and finding talent, developing talent, and then Tennis Canada would just go, Boop, thanks very much, we'd steal their, their athletes, put them into our regional training centers, take them to the national training center, put them on the world stage, and they are our athletes, and the, the coaches who had given blood, sweat, and tears were nowhere to be found, so they hated us. And so again, I just said, well, let's get together. Let's figure out how do we make sure that we do this right? One, that you feel respected, but two, that we're developing, like you have smart ideas, Tennis Canada has smart ideas, how, how can we have a better development system? And so we met um, regularly with uh, private coaches and those were really ruckus meetings and lots of yelling. And I remember a guy storming out of one of those meetings, honestly, never yelled at more. Um, but I am not kidding, I'm reading this to you. This is from Friday, two days ago. This one was a coach, she ran an academy in Niagara, Niagara Falls. Here's the email she sent me two days ago. I've always wanted to write and thank you for your work at Tennis Canada, specifically with the coaches group that was trying so desperately to improve the tennis community in Ontario. I so respected your input and the inclusion you extended to each of us despite any differences of opinions, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. I was very disappointed when you left TC as it had been the first time that I'd ever been acknowledged by someone at TC in my 35 plus year history in the industry. Human, authentic connections. My last two examples, Dennis Shapovalov. Love that guy, I love him. I love Felix Ojeel Sam as so much as I love Dennis Shapovalov. They're such wonderful kids. Anyways, uh, Dennis uh, was coached by his mom. And uh, those were crazy meetings, though I didn't go to those meetings, but there was a lot of swearing and yelling. And those meetings would be Dennis's family, his parents, not Dennis, and our guys, and they'd be yelling at each other because they didn't believe Tennis Canada was giving them the support that they needed and Tennis Canada needs something in return and screaming, swearing matches. So I said to my guys, I said, why don't I just call Tessa? Like, why don't I meet with Tessa, woman to woman? And they're like, oh, good luck with that. That's never gonna happen. She's Russian, you know? And I said, well, I happen to have Russian blood. So I phoned Tessa, I said, look, I'll come meet you. And um, she said, no, I'm gonna come to you. So she arrived and she was really, really tough and quite cold and shook my hand and um, we just chatted. And I asked her about her story. I asked her about Dennis's story. I asked how that happened. And um, I asked her what she needed from Tennis Canada. And I'm not a pushover, just so you're clear. I'm not a pushover. But I, if you talk about these things, you can figure out wh what's the common ground. And um, she and I met several times. Um, but I would tell you after that first meeting, she hugged me. And I'm like, ugh, human, authentic relationships. And here's my last one on this one. So I um, am passionate. And when I sit in boxes at tournaments, uh, at professional tournaments, I'm really not allowed to cheer, but that's impossible for me. So I've been told to be quiet in, in lots of those boxes before. Anyways, when Vashik Pospisil and Jack Sock were at Wimbledon in the finals, Wimbledon finals, I was in Vashik's player's box. I was screaming my head off. Like I, I honestly just wanted Vashik to win so badly because he's such a nice guy and he won. And so Vashik and actually Daniel Nestor and his wife, Natasha, and the girls uh, and I were all on the same flight coming home, London to Toronto. And so uh, I was in the big seats because I fly a lot and I have a lot of points. And those two were in the back. And um, Vashik was probably in row 75 next to the window. And he's a very tall guy with his legs wrapped around his neck. And um, so I wrote a note and asked the flight attendant if she could give it to the captain. I just said, hey, you know, you have on board. Vashik Pospisil, who's just won Wimbledon, and you have Daniel Nestor, who's probably the winningest Canadian athlete of all time. Could you just have him go over the PA system and just say, hey, congrats, Vashik, and we're so happy you're, you're with us, Daniel. And so I'm working, because at Tennis Canada, I worked 90 hours a week, I'm working, 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 and I can feel someone beside me. So I look over, and um, he said, are you Kelly? I said, yes. He goes, I'm Captain Bob. I said, Captain Bob, this is fantastic. Nice to meet you. He said. Seriously, do you know Vashik and Daniel? I said, yeah, I know them. He said, could you introduce me? I said, absolutely. He goes, okay, wait, wait, wait. So he runs off, goes to the cockpit, he comes back, he's got his tie on and his hat now. 
And so he goes, okay, okay, this is great. So I take him over to meet Daniel and Natasha and, and the wee girls. And then we go back to row 75 to find Vashik squished against a window. And he has to sort of unfold himself and he comes out and um, I introduce him. And then the plane starts to figure out, ah, oh, this is Vashik Pospisil. And I'm not kidding. The plane was lined in the aisle all the way in economy all the way around, then in line to see his trophy because it was in his carry-on, have him sign autographs. And, and my authentic, lovely, human relationship with Captain Bob uh, continues today. He was my guest at every Rogers Cup that uh, I hosted. So there is no substitute, human, authentic relationships. My next uh, learning, but again, this was just reinforced. I had this learning already. We must have the courage to do the right thing always, always, always. So this is about integrity. This is about moral compass. This is about looking yourself in the mirror and feeling great about the, the person who's looking back at you. And so in my first um, couple of months at Participation, I had a board member who was really excited that I was the new CEO because he had a business I'll keep it confidential. He had a business and he knew I was pretty connected because I come from the business world. And uh, he thought I could probably increase his business by a long shot because I knew a lot of people I could introduce him. And then he thought we could take sort of the prestige um, of participation and helped grow his business. And then he said his, bro his brother's company was supplying us. I don't even know what it was. We had no money at participation. So I don't know, it was probably like for $10 and 45 cents, but his brother was going to be supplying it. And I said, you know, that's not really how we operate. So if it's a big one, we have to do an RFP, but if it's just a small one, we at least have to get competitive bids. We can't give it to your brother. And um, his little face went fiery red and he was furious with me. And um, it kind of continued on for a little while longer. And then I went to the governance committee. I said, look, this is out of my hands. This is for you. You figure out, but if you think this is the proper behavior, knock yourselves out. It doesn't feel right to me. It feels wrong and maybe you wanna have a little chat with him. And they did have a little chat and they actually, their little chat was that he should retire. I actually thought they were gonna fire me, but they asked him to be fired. So they fired him. And that was the right thing to do. At Tennis Canada, I have three. One is, uh, again, very early days, man, I really established myself early at both these organizations. Um, a paper came across my desk, I was supposed to sign this, and I'm looking at it and it's something for the Ontario government. And um, I'm looking at it, it says that we did certain things with the money they gave us. And I spoke to my team. I said, I, I don't, did we do these things? I don't, I don't remember. Did we do these things? They said, well, not exactly. So we put an application to the Ontario government. Peter, don't listen. And um, then they gave us money. But we didn't actually do what we said we were going to do in the application. So we did something else, but it was really good. It was really important, but we have to write them a report at the end now to tell them that we did what we put in our application with their money. I said, I'm not signing this. They're like, what? I said, no, we're going to give them the $75,000 back. What? I said, yes, we're, we're giving them $75,000 back. The interior government, by the way, didn't know what, how to even take it back because they've never been given money back. So it was like a huge mess, a huge bureaucratic mess. But I tell you, man, that set the tone in my organization. I was new at Tennis Canada. The culture was clear. Integrity is absolutely paramount. We are not lying about anything. Second, uh, again, early days at Tennis Canada, uh, I had a CFO and uh, I just felt like we had no financial processes or systems because I couldn't find anything and I had no reason why this was this. And we weren't File, we hadn't filed um, taxes in five years. Now, we don't have to pay taxes, we're not for, but you have to file taxes. And then there was just a little funny thing for me. Um, at Tennis Canada, we had a couple of corporations, one because, just because of Quebec and a French piece of it in English Canada. And I just felt like monies might have been moving back and forth, not completely correctly. So I fired them and um, I'm new. I now have no financial systems and no financial officer. Uh, but I took on the role of CFO. I rolled up my sleeves and just said, you know, if you lead something, you got to know about the numbers. So I was the CEO and the CFO of Tennis Canada for three months. Um, but that was the right thing to do because we were doing some not right things, I believe. 
And my last example is, so he shall remain nameless, but we had um, have a um, athlete who was successful, very financially successful, and yet was getting money from Tennis Canada. And it was just a check that we wrote every year. No, no terms to the deal, we just wrote him a check. And I'm like, what? Like, can you imagine if anyone finds out that little tiny Tennis Canada, a not, like a not-for-profit NSO, is giving this guy money? Are you crazy? And so I met with the athlete and I said, like, come on, this is bad for you, this is bad for us, this makes no sense. So here's what I do. Here's what I'd, I'd propose. Let's have a deal, but it's pay for performance. So if you do commercials for us, we'll pay you. If you play Davis Cup, we'll pay you. If you're nice to us, they say nice things about us in the press, we'll pay you. But you have to pay some of them. Not Felix or Dennis, they're so cute, but some of them you have to pay. So um, he and I left Handshake in my office, done, one-on-one -on -one meeting, thought it was done. Uh, his parents went to the former, who's now the current CEO of Tennis Canada, to complain about me. Uh, his um, agent went to my board to complain about me. And he went to one of the most prominent business people in Canada to complain about me. And when I got called by this guy to go see him, I thought, this is spectacular. I'm, I'm, he's probably going to give us money. And instead, he, was, he gave me heck and said, what are you doing? And my board actually said, what are you doing? Like, of course we need him on side. I said, of course we want him on side, but it's pay for performance. And so um, the athletes team uh, absolutely refused to negotiate with me. Uh, they refused. So they said, we like this guy in your organization and we like this guy on your board. I said, fine, they'll negotiate with you. And I was at the Rio games and um, I'm, on the call, I'm on the phone like every half hour talking to these guys who are negotiating because they wanted to keep giving in. I'm like, no, we're not giving in. These are the terms. So you're negotiating, but here are the terms. Let me help you with that. And um, eventually we negotiated the right deal. Um, but of course, I was blackballed uh, by that athlete and his family and the team. I didn't sit in his player's box ever again. And um, I, I did the right thing. We did the right thing. And um, I'm okay with that. We must have the courage to do the right thing every time. My fifth little lesson. You can hear. I'm learning these things through the hard way, right? My fifth is the sport world needs more women. We need women in the business of sport. We need more women on the ground as coaches, as umpires, as refs, officials, therapists, trainers, and we need more female participants. For me, without a doubt. And I think that we really need role models to develop, mentor, sponsor, is that the music I'm being called off the stage? Um, develop, um, now I lost my total train of thought, but to sponsor and um, inspire the next generation of either players or coaches or people in the business of sport. We need to do that. And um, I was giving you participation stats earlier. Boys are twice as likely to meet those physical activity guidelines of one hour a day than girls. And in teen years, the disparity between those stats increases exponentially. So just think if we had more women coaching or more women on the, the field refing, do you think we might be able to inspire more girls? And then more girls could actually imagine themselves also being coaches. In tennis, it's completely driven by men. And I'm not a raging feminist. Honest to God, I am so not a raging feminist. But, you know, there's some benefit to, to having different perspectives. I, I believe this. And so... Um, at um, the ATP and the WTA, their CEOs are both, even WTA, are men. I think I was the only female president of a tennis federation in the world in history. I also think I was the only female who led a Masters 1000 ATP tennis tournament in the world in history. So um, the Masters 1000 tournament is totally interesting because we owned our own media rights. And so uh, we had an investment banker uh, value those rights and it was like a billion and a half dollars. So this is a really powerful group. And it's all old white guys and me. And at first they weren't quite sure what to do with me. Uh, one of the guys, he's a complete character, Jan Tiriak from uh, Romania. He goes, lady, lady, what are you doing here? 
I said, hey, I belong here. I run Tennis Canada. He's like, I run Rogers Cup. Who are you again? Anyways, eventually they became my boyfriends. And Jan Tyriak, especially my husband, said, I think he's your boyfriend. Um, but it took a while, and they knew I was tough, but they actually, despite that, somehow they liked me. So we'd be at this table, all the guys and me, and I am not kidding. They would talk about how male tennis, men's tennis, runs tennis. It drives all the revenue, drives all the sponsorship, not women's tennis. They would talk about female players. These are the professional players are lazy. Um, and there was tons of pushback, as you can imagine, you know, the men's tournaments having, hosting women's tournaments at the same time. And then of course, you certainly know the story about uh, player prize money and equal player prize money. So there is lots of debate in the tennis world. That's the one I know. And um, I do think it needs some more female voices to uh, just bring some different perspectives. And on that note, here's my little example. So uh, I said this in my podcast uh, leading up to the summit. Uh, I, uh, our national coach, Louis Barfiga, is from France, very diminutive man. And when I first arrived, I met every one of the 150 employees one-on-one -on -one to say, who are you? How do you fit in? What's your story? You know, I'm Kelly. Here's who I am. And um, so when I met with Louis, he goes, I, I can't do the French accent justice, but he basically said, don't mess with me. You're not going to mess with me, are you? I said, Louis, I know nothing about tennis development. I am not going to mess with you. Um, but we, he came to me to say, Kelly, we have a problem. Um, Bianca Andreescu turns, turns, turns 14 soon, and um, her mom is not, she's refusing. She will not allow Bianca to go to our national training center in Montreal. I said, Louis, I'm a woman. I have grandkids. I wouldn't let my 14-year-old daughter go to Montreal to live when she's 14 by herself and train at our national training center. It's just not what I would do either. He said, well, we have a training system. We have a development system. You can't, like, this is sound. It's working. If you, if you, if you change things, you're going to have cracks in the system. I said, look, Every good system needs to have flexibility, and we need to have flexibility. Bianca lives 20 minutes from our Toronto Regional Training Center. So get the best coaches in the world. Get the best trainers in the world, therapists in the world, nutritionists in the world, sports psychologists in the world, and let's do all of that in Toronto. And um, it's the only time I overruled Louis, even though I did continue to pester him to hire someone in the world must be a great female coach somewhere in the world. Um, anyways, this is the only time I overruled him. And so it's just my little, little, little tiny story. I have no, I take no credit for any of our athletes' success, but that's my little piece of Bianca Andreescu. And now you hear her in, in the press conferences and she talks about Tennis Canada and the important role that it's played. And I just love her. I'm so proud of her. And I feel proud of Tennis Canada for that. So we really need more women in sport. And finally, my last lesson. Power, uh, sport has the power to change a kid's life. Sport has the power to better people's lives. Sport has the power to make communities stronger. Sport has the power to galvanize a country. Sport has the power to change the world. You, my friends, have the power to change the world. And I'm counting on you. Thank you. I think we have mics, actually. But maybe they're not down here just yet. Oh, here, I, my mic's on. Okay, my mic's on. And here comes a mic for you. Okay, now we've got our system rolling. They didn't expect me to finish in 38 minutes, and so I, I kept them off a little bit off guard. Okay, yes. Wow. Thank you for that amazing speech. I was debating coming here at 10 a.m., but I am so happy I showed up. Oh, thank you. You made my day. Thank you. That's very nice. Thank you. As a trailblazer yourself, what advice do you have for our female, whether it's officials, coaches, uh, and even our upcoming, you know, younger people. What, what do you suggest, especially given 
how much of a trailblazer you are. I'm really curious. Yeah, there's no quick or easy answer for sure. Um, but I do believe in mentors. I believe in sponsors. And um, anytime anyone asks to meet with me, I just say yes. And particularly women in sport. At Tennis Canada, I mean, I honestly, I don't believe in quota systems. And my bar is set very high. I cannot tell you how high achieving I aim, drive for myself and for my teams. But we had half of my leadership team were women and half were men. When I arrived, that wasn't the case. And I'm gone, and the old guy came back, and it's back to one woman on the leadership team. Um, and we had half and half women throughout the organization. I mean, half the people who play tennis are women. So you'd think that we could find some pretty good women to work in Tennis Canada. And we did. And some of those young women have left because there is no mentor, sponsor, or someone to inspire them. And I think being the CEO of that organization mattered. And I think that young women felt like they could imagine themselves moving somewhere. Um, tennis is often thought to be an old boys network. By the way, my greatest achievement at Tennis Canada was that our employee survey results ended up after my time. My last year was 98% people, people satisfaction. Very proud of that. But lots of those young women have left and they still call me. So I do lots of mentoring to those young women. So I would say uh, if you're in this room and you're a woman, look for other women to sponsor you, mentor you, fantastic. And then please look for young women that you can mentor and sponsor and see if we can continue to just move, move, move. It will be slow. I do think that we need to figure out how to make sport as interesting for girls as it is for boys. Um, and how do we keep girls? That's the big problem. How do we keep girls? And I do think some of that also is female coaches. And again, I'm not a raging feminist and you guys, I'm so sorry if you're taking any offense to this, but if we could have more female coaches, I think it would help for girls who are on the, on the field. They would feel like, okay, uh, I'm, not the, I'm not the only girl here. So not an easy answer and probably not even a very good answer, but I, I just think we just have to keep working at it, but thinking about it. And again, hire the best though, hire the best. Don't hire me because I'm a woman, I will die. I never want anyone to say I got my job because I'm a woman. But let's go find the best who are women. Any others? Is, did I answer your question, do you think? Okay, first of all, what's your name? Sorry. Victor, okay, Toronto Victor. Referee Soccer Association. I'm okay. a ref. And you're a ref? Yes. Okay, so do you have any influence? Are there other, like, could we have clinics for refs and make sure that we've got some females at some of those clinics? Absolutely, like that mentorship development, totally on board. I was just curious, what else would you suggest? Do you have a daughter? Not yet. Oh, not yet. Okay. Victor, speak with your girlfriend. You got to have a daughter. <laughs> and for the men in the room, any suggestions? <laughs> you know what? I do think, I think guys just, um, you want the best and see if you can find some females, whether it's um, as coaches on your teams or um, even, you know, like you said, refs, I think really important to see them on the field. I mean, NFL has one female ref, right? Yeah, they do. Uh, yes. And sorry, thanks, Victor. And sorry, what's your name? Joe. Joe? Yeah. Hello, Joe. How's it going? I'm pretty okay. Um, so I had a question about your deal you signed with Coca-Cola. You said there was a lot of negativity around associating tennis with um, Coca-Cola brand. So how did you get around that? What strategies did you use to try to turn it into something positive? Yeah, so, um, and obviously participation, the reason there is negative press is because they said, well, you're supposed to be for goodness and Coca-Cola is evil and they have evil products. And so um, we had some guidelines with Coca-Cola and they agreed to these, by the way. So we never had an event with Coca-Cola. We were serving any of the sugary drinks. We didn't even sh serve um, any of their uh, juices. We only served their water. Uh, they weren't promoting their product. We didn't talk about their product. We just used their brand. And um, when people spoke with me about, in their mind, the contentious relationship, I used facts. So the facts are, here's the inactivity of teenagers. Here is the issue in terms of getting kids more, or here's, here's the benefit of having those teenagers more active. And then as we started to glean results from our, our partnership, I would put those results right back at them and say, how else would we ever get half a million 
teenagers in Canada involved in all, all provinces and territories. We had programs going in every province and territory. But I just used facts and I just kept going with the facts. Um, and um, in the end, I think it was I think it was a spectacular partnership, actually. $10 million over 10 years. Where else are you gonna get $10 million over 10 years? And we didn't sell our soul. I really don't believe we sold our soul. I believe that we used their, the equity in their brand and their global reach to, um, to really be significant and, and relevant to teenagers. Um, anyone else? Oh, here we go. Hey, a woman, look at that, see? Hi, You're inspired. Uh I'm uh, Kathy, and I represent uh, a female soccer club. Uh, sorry, can you say your name again, please? Kathy. Oh, Kathy, sorry. Um, bear with me, because there was a lot of amazing information that completely tied together all, everything I heard over the past weekend. Um, but I'm going to go back to keeping youth in sports, um, specifically females, and touch on your point about authentic um, human connection. Uh, we all know that the youth these days, as we heard from uh, the first speaker on Friday, is their attention span is much smaller than before. At the same time, we're dealing with um, parents, that generation, that expect to kind of see what they're used to. How do we find that balance for both sides of the consumer, the ones that pay the money and the ones that want to be in it to keep them engaged because we keep hearing about the drop off at 13, 14. And I think there's so many different reasons for it. Um, and part of it is attention, keeping their attention and still keeping the integrity of the repetitiveness that we need to do to get them to train, to develop their skills. But we know that that doesn't interest them. Okay, so for the rest of you, if somebody could find an easy question for me, it would be really, I would really appreciate it. Uh, because three very difficult ones so far. Um, I mean, I do not have any answers, as I promised at the beginning. Remember the disclaimer, no, no wisdom? Um, I do think there's something about inspiration, and I think there's something about fun. I mean, I think that um, teenagers think that being on screens is fun. I don't understand it at all, because I find them terribly boring. But um, I think there's something about something that's inspiring and something that's fun. I do think that. I think there's a lot of work we need to do with parents, actually. And I said this again in my podcast that led up to today. Parents, I mean, we're knocking ourselves out. We're doing the best job we can do. And in my day, my mom was home with us. So she drove us to every sport. I played every sport. She took us to every sport. And parents don't do that today. So kids get home after school, and um, they're unsupervised, and they go straight to screens. And so I think there is some work we need to do with parents to convince them of these health benefits. Like, they're honestly health benefits. They're academic benefits. They're mental health benefits to kids being in sport and, and seeing if we can convince them of those things so that after school, the kid actually has to go to a soccer practice, the soccer field, as opposed to going home unsupervised. But I don't have, I don't have really great answers for you. I, I think the only way we can do it is that the kids want to be there and we've got their parents supporting them, getting them there. Beyond that, I don't know. I think you know better than me what, what kids think are what kids think is fun. Um, but I think it has to be fun. I think when it's a drag, they're like, ugh, I can go home. I don't know. I'm not, that wasn't very insightful, Kathy. Sorry. What's your answer to your question? I'd love to hear your answer. You probably have lots of great thoughts. I don't know. I think we, we're all kind of battling the same thing and trying yeah. to find that middle. And I think we do need to try to find a way to constantly change the activities that we do, new yeah. ways to um, have them develop the same skill yeah. because of their attention span. And then the piece that I, I said is, from my own experience, is the parents want to see something. And when we change what they're used to, they don't, it takes a long time for them to buy in. The key might be if the kid, like you said, is engaged and is enjoying it, then it's a lot harder for that parent to pull them out of that program because they're going to not want to leave. So I think that's the focus to get the engagement of our, cons our true consumer, which is the player. I do. I think it's a two-way thing. I think it's the kid, and I do. Uh, kid, I don't. I, I don't say that um, to be flippant, but 
and, and I think there is something about the parents too. We need the parents to be supportive. Um, it's a little bit of what I said earlier, you know, you need them on side, you gotta bring them into the, the conversation, I think. Other questions? Okay. Hi, okay, I'm great. Jen. Hi, Jen. Um, I think they have to see it to be it. I mean, if 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 moms and dads are out there playing a sport, even rec level, refereeing, continuing to coach, the kids want to grow up and do that. So we need to also put down our devices and uh, go outside. It wasn't a question, sorry. It was just... Yeah, it comes back to the important role that parents play, right? Role models. I believe strongly in role models. I think this gentleman was... Oh, oh where are we going? Oh, here. Okay. Hello. Hi. Uh, Paul. Paul. Um, Hello, Paul. I'm Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Um, I guess a similar question, uh, or previous question, is um, you mentioned that uh, kids are spending two hours on a screen or online or more, but less than 60 minutes a day uh, being active. Earlier this week, this weekend, we heard about esports. Esports. Um, I know Ontario Soccer have talked about that as well. How do we either embrace that or to include it within our programming, or how do we combat that to say get off the computer, get off online, and get on the field? I don't think we can battle it. Um, you know, one thing that we tried to do was a sponsorship deal with one of those esport companies. Like it was very early on when esports was just sort of um, the nascent stage because I thought if they were part of the conversation with us, then they could be part of the solution because they would know how to speak to their customers and help them get them to be our customers as well. So I think there's something in that, and, and maybe you could speak to Johnny Misley and see if he can go do a sponsorship deal with them. Actually, with Chris, um, oh shoot, what's Chris's last name? He ran the, the Canadian Olympic uh, Committee, Chris Overholt. And um, he runs an e-sport e e uh, company now. Let's go get Chris Overholt on side. Um, and then I think the other thing is, we probably do have to build it in a little bit to what we're doing. I mean, they're here to stay. It's not, we can't say that don't do it, um, but if there's some way to limit it. And again, I think it's the same thing I said to Kathy. I think we have to make what we're doing on the field and outdoors fun. And, and then what Jen said, I mean, having parents on side and showing us role models, but I don't think we're gonna battle esports. I don't think it's gonna go away. I think we wanna have them on side and helping us because they don't actually like the rep they have right now as well. They, everyone knows that when kids are doing esports, they're sedentary, they're not getting active and they're, they're becoming obesity and uh, obese and um, really unhealthy. So I would pull them on side. That's what I think. I think Johnny should do it. Good. Hi, my name's Cam. I just wanted to make a suggestion, a very simple suggestion to help out uh, for girls. And also, I think it would work for um, boys, but I've coached for a lot of years. And I've always incorporated music, not my music, the music of the age of the player. Um, I play it loud for the, all the warm ups, and then I keep it playing for all the drills, uh, not so loud but uh, enough that they can hear it, they seem to appreciate it, they want to come to practice, I let them pick the songs. It's easy to put on your phone and little speakers. Seems to work well, keeps them engaged. Wow, great idea, Cam. I mean, it comes back to, we're not gonna change kids, so let's figure out who they are and what it is that they find fun and what do they think uh, makes it interesting to go and hang out with you. So, great, that's a great idea, Cam. So there's. There's some, there's insight right there. That's wisdom. That's what you're paying for. Uh, hi, hi, Kelly. My name is Alice. Oh, okay. where are you, Alice? Way up. Oh, there. Hi, Alice. Okay. Good morning. Um, I read in your bio, you have a social work background. Yeah. And you talked a little bit about your involvement with parents. Um, I have a very big concern around the mental health of our athletes. And we talk a lot about the positive impact that coaches can have. We had a fantastic safe sport panel last night. But what, what's your thinking or maybe your advice, if you have any, about um, you know, being responsible for kids' mental health and understanding not only can we have a positive impact, we might be able to deal with some of the negative stuff they're experiencing. But at the same time, we might be some of that negative stuff as well. 
Yeah, so this is for sure not my area of expertise, but um, I mean, that we have that opportunity to influence the mental health of kids, what, what an honor to play that role. And so it is sending all of the right messages from Safe Sport, and, and the person that you would have heard from last night would be much better expert than me on that. Um, but just even having them outdoors and running around, that's good for them. That's good for their mental health. Um, I do think there's a whole conversation around coaching and, and style of coaching, and I mean, there was that whole issue at University of Guelph, which I think I'm coming off a board because of uh, that whole, how they've handled that matter. But um, your, your panel last night would have much better expert advice in terms of from a coaching perspective. But I think just having them out there and being a great role model and listening. Honestly, as a kid, those coaches had no clue that we had chaos going on in my home. But because they were sending me great messages and they they cared about me. I felt like they cared about me and they got to know me, human authentic relationships. They asked me about me. Obviously I had some secrets I didn't tell them, but they asked me about me. I think that alone is unbelievably special and never underestimate the power of that because kids don't get that from every place anymore. And certainly they don't get it, I don't think at school so often. So um, never underestimate that. And as a social worker, that was my only goal. I mean, I was working with children's aid, so I worked with parents who abused their kids. And um, I wanted to have authentic relationships, but these are people who abuse their kids. And so I would work very hard to figure out what did I authentically respect about that person and join with them on that one thing. It was real, it was true, I wasn't making it up. So maybe I didn't appreciate these aspects, but I appreciated that. And if you could get to know them, Sometimes some of those parents, it was the first time anyone had ever listened to them and, and asked them. So I just think authentic human relationships is the, probably the less expert kind of answer that I could give you that I have some background in. Thanks. Kelly, we have uh, time for one more question. Okay. Who gets the last question? Hello. Hi. Uh, I just want to echo. You have to tell me your name, though. My name is Alex. Alice? I just Al spoke to Alice. Yes. Alex. Oh, Alex. Okay, that's um, different. I just want to echo what Victor had said because um, I, I wasn't going to come here this morning, but this was well worth the, the time. Um, I wanted to ask you about integrity. Um, so you had mentioned that at times you had to make difficult decisions um, to maintain that integrity. How much planning did you put in place before pulling the trigger on those kind of decisions? Um, or were some of them impulsive and you just, in your core, you felt it was not, um, something wasn't right and you just had to make that difficult decision or did you really put some thought into what the fall back was going to be and um, how you were potentially gonna rebound from that? So um, I'm not an impulsive person, but my gut response was immediate. So I, I felt I knew when something was wrong, uh, but my plan was premeditated and well thought out. Um, because I, I don't want to get fired for no reason, uh, and I want to make sure that at least I have a fair hearing, and then if someone wants to fire me. And I'll just tell you one story about this. I don't know if Ben's going to kill me. Um, so another story at Tennis Canada was um, the, the guy who was running Montreal and our French-Canadian operations, um, he felt that he ran French Tennis Canada, and I ran English Tennis Canada. And I let him know, I said, no, I actually run Tennis Canada and you run our Montreal operation. And he just would not play by the rules. He back-channeled to the board often. And um, he, he just wouldn't move in line with the team. And um, I went to the chair of the board and I said, just a heads up, he's my guy, I'm the CEO, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it, but I just want to give you a heads up, I might have to fire him. And he's like, well, this is a big deal. Like, we better have a board meeting. And so he called a board meeting, and then I wasn't invited to the board meeting. I phoned my husband and said, I think I'm getting fired. And um, the board really considered whether they were going to fire me or they were going to let me fire him. And I said, it's in my contract. I have the right to hire, fire my team. And so I did not do this lightly. I mean, I really thought through every single conversation. I actually even had a lawyer help me think through some of it. Um, and in the end, uh, the board came to me and said, we, we choose you. I said, great. And they said, so what do you want us to do? I said, 
I've been flipping over backwards, like, this guy used to hold meetings in French, and he didn't think I, I knew French, but I, I, I do, I understand French, so he would hold them thinking I couldn't understand meetings. It's so disrespectful. In any case, um, I said, I'm not doing the backflip this time. I'm not going to his office. He's coming to my office this time. And you and another member of the board are going to let him know that I'm his boss. I might be able to, I might fire him. He's no longer allowed to back channel to the board and uh, he needs to play by the rules. And I basically scripted it out for them and the chair of the board was old school and, and he, he basically read it. It was the shortest meeting in history. Do you understand? He said yes. Um, he was dismissed from the meeting. I met with him the next day, just one-on-one. -on -one. I said, do you want your job? He said, I don't know, I need to think about it. I said, how long do you need? He said, two weeks. I said, great, come back in two weeks, let me know if you want your job. I just want you to know the ground rules are, you and I are gonna communicate more often. Uh, we are going to move in the same direction and we're going to physically skip up and down the halls so our people know that you and I are a team. Those are the ground rules. And come back in two weeks, let me know if you want your job. Came back in two weeks, said I want my job. I said, fantastic. And we are not friends, we don't keep in touch, but we respect one another and did respect one another. We figured out how to work together. And um, at the holiday party that year, honest to God, this is my first year, I swear they probably wanted to fire me so many times. Um, at the holiday party that year, he won an award that the employees decided he won. And so I delivered the award and I delivered it in French. And uh, he came up to get it and we hugged each other. And every single employee, 150 people, stood up standing ovation because everyone knows when there's crap going on. They know what's going on. And they also knew that we had figured it out and resolved it. So. Impulse, I knew what was going on was wrong, but very strategic in terms of how I addressed it. That's the end. Thank you very much.